Hello and welcome to Elevens is with Lisa. I'm Lisa Louise Cook and um, today I want to ask you, what do you think that family history has in common with iconic movies like Airplane and The Naked Gun? Well, the answer is David Zucker. David has spent his long career as a storyteller in Hollywood. He's been writing, directing, and producing movies. But even before that, he's been passionate about telling his own family story. And that's what led him to write his new book. It's called Before the Invention of Smiling. It's a touching tale about his grandmother, Sarah Zucker. She was really the thread between the old world of Europe and the new world of America for the Zucker family. And today on Elevens is with Lisa, the one and only David Zucker is here to dish on what went on behind the scenes of his classic movies, and even more importantly, to share his journey of uncovering and telling his own family's story. So let's get right to it. Well, okay. So welcome to the show, David Zucker. I'm so glad that you're here. I am glad to be here too, actually. Yes. Now I have to tell you the first time I ever saw you and it was um, at a girl's sleepover in 1974. What was I doing there? Well, I know actually it was that it was such a big deal. You had to stay up and you had to be awake for midnight special. <laughs> yeah, the Kentucky Fried Troop. Weren't you guys on Midnight Special? And you did That's this routine. That's right. We were Midnight Special. We left the Midwest about one year ago now to come out to L.A. and open our little theater. We drove together in Jerry's van. The past time, we played fun games like this slide of name the license plate. <laughs> right. Yeah, we were as a performing group. And you just happened to be watching Midnight Special. Oh, every Friday night, we had yeah. our big sleepover. We made popcorn balls and watched Midnight Special. And they had yeah. musical groups, but then they had these wild and crazy guys who came out and did comedy. Yeah, and I think it was uh, hosted by Wolfman Jack. Yes, I think. <laughs> for a while at least, yeah. Yeah. And now you did the troupe with uh, Jerry, your brother, right? And he Jim was Abrams. A, and Jim Abrams. So has your career always been like a family affair? Yeah, well... You know, Jerry and I started this Kentucky Fried Theater in Milwaukee and Madison. We had a theater in, that we built in the back of a bookstore in Madison, <clears throat> um, right near the campus. And our partner was Jim Abrams. <clears throat> and there was one other guy, <clears throat> Dick Chudnow, who left the group uh, after a year. But he was also from our high school. We were all from Sherwood High School, first suburb north of Milwaukee. So... Yeah, it was kind of a family affair, and all the families knew each other. That's so cool. In fact, in fact Jim's dad and my dad were business partners. It was, uh, they, yeah, they had a oh. real estate company, Abrahams and Zucker. So these families and our sisters were best friends, college roommates. I mean, these families were close. And, and this so, is, you're from Milwaukee. You're from Wisconsin, right? So Wisconsin. good Midwestern, Midwestern values and families. And yeah, it was just, yeah, we, right from that. And then we moved out to LA and, uh, you know, we got through it without, you know, changing too much. And you guys all continued to work together, right? I mean, we continued to work together and we're still working. We're actually working on a, on a book about, you know, it's called uh, Surely You Can't Be Serious. And it will be kind of the format of Before the Invention of Smiling with a lot of photographs and an oral history. We're going, we're telling the story about how we started in 1971. And eight years later, we, we did Airplane. That's amazing. And we're going to talk so, about that. We're, we're talking about the book too, Before the Invention of Smiling, which yes. I love your titles. I mean, yeah, holy yeah. cow. I, I, I had to stop myself from doing a Shirley joke to introduce myself, but 
you know, yeah, I, we all yeah. love that from airplane, but yeah, and I have to, I admit, I probably got three quarters of the way of the book. And then I went, Oh, I get what the title is now. It's those stoic faces that our the families had faces. forever. Well, the title is title was, I had a, a couple of other titles, uh, you know, something involving grandma. And then yeah. one of the titles was from Hinkovitz to Hollywood. And that was, that was her little, uh, her town hungry. And then, but I it was, it was bigger than that. I didn't want to make it about me. And that's another book, but, um, I mean, a lot of the book of course is about, you know, my journey, but, yeah. uh, I, I know on one of the pictures in the book, which was of my grandfather, when he, my grand, it looked like he was about 13 and his father, and they're just, you know, looking into the camera and unsmiling. Right. And I realized that nobody smiled for pictures then. It was, that was something invented in what, the 1940s maybe? It was, but. Well, and back in the way back in the day when they first started, it took so long to take a photograph. Yes. You couldn't hold a smile that long. And then before that for portraits, yeah. They had to sit for a long time for a portrait. Mm-hmm. And in in many cases, they had the bad teeth. So right. everybody's, you know, <laughs> closed mouth and not, <laughs> and that's fine. So that the caption to that picture of my grandfather and his father was, I just put before the invention of smiling. And then I realized that should be the title of the book. Totally. It's, book. It is perfect. And it encompasses everybody. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and you put a lot of photos in there. Now, in case anybody doesn't recognize the name, I have to say, of course, you are the director, what producer, writer of iconic comedies like Airplane and the Naked Gun movies. Um, and I just saw that, didn't Airplane just have like a 40th anniversary? You have yes, we're anniversary. in the 40th anniversary this year. In 40 years? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, time went quickly. Yeah. And what happened was that, you know, the, the, the movie has really, it's, it's lasted and it's, it's it being, is. it's still funny. That's, that's what's I think kind of unique about it. it. It had, it does have a timeless quality to it, which is great. You know, it's just, you know, I think the only thing that dates it is the fact that you can't go past security. Now, if you're saying goodbye to somebody on the tarmac, you can't do right. that anymore. That's it. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So a lot of things have changed in the, you know, in, in the airplane, the luggage racks are open. And I guess yes, yes, they were open. They didn't have. They didn't. <laughs> Can you imagine turbulence and they all just go flying? That would yeah, have been and, and the smoking and non-smoking sections, yes. which seems ludicrous now. <laughs> it's funny. I was watching. I'm a huge old movie buff, and I was watching Dana Andrews, one of my favorite actors, and he was in a movie called Zero Hour. And I was thinking, oh, this is Airplane before yes. Airplane. Did, did that movie influence you at all? Completely. We really <laughs> we got the idea because we we would watch late night movies. Uh, this was in the mid seventies for our Kentucky Fried Theater show, right. which we had on Pico Boulevard here in West LA. And we would we would uh, leave on our re- old reel to reel videotape deck overnight <laughs> and record the old movies. That's when they played them. Commercial. Well, pardon me. That's when they played them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and 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 what we what we were, our goal was to get, record the commercials and we would do commercial spoofs oh. on, on stage where we had a video monitor on stage. Anyway, so one morning we clear off the machine and it was zero hour. And so instead of, you know, you know, concentrating on the commercials at all, we said, this movie is awesome. This is, this, we could, the first thought, we, we used to redub things and, you know, we put our own, you know, jokes in the, in the, you know, over, overdubbed the, but they, they were so serious. Put yourself in this man's place. Can you fly this airplane and land it? No, not a chance. You're the only chance we've got. I want you to get on a horn and talk this guy down. You'll have to talk him onto the approach. And so help me, you'll have to talk him right down to the ground. We thought, why don't we make a movie out of this? And I thought, why don't we recast the, uh, you know, recast the movie with straight actors, not do 
not cast Bill Murray or Chevy Chase, who were the the comic actors of that time. But uh, you know, we'll do we'll recast the movie and do it as a real as a serious movie. But and, it's, course, and it's wild. You made comedies without comedians. Yeah, really. Well, that was that made it difficult to pitch the thing to the studio. <laughs> Every studio turned it down, and one one executive who was. I guess insane or just thought out of the box that our whole career hung on one guy and his name was Michael Eisner, who was the president of Paramount at the time. And he said, yeah, this is good. I like this. Let's make it. So, you know, it's like in uh, nine other executives who uh, turned it down. And that made huge amount of money for them. Oh, My yeah. Well, the budget was like 3.2 million. Tiny. Which was now now in my later movies, it was the catering budget, you know. <laughs> but but this 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 thing uh, in, it made its money back the first weekend, and it made eighty million uh, just in the U.S. and Canada alone, and then foreign, international, it made another uh, eighty million. So uh, we actually made money out of it because the studio couldn't hide it fast enough. <laughs> And that was way back then. I mean, that's amazing today. Yes. I mean, now we so I of course had to rewatch Airplane again, which who could get tired of rewatching Airplane? Yeah. And um, my my daughter uh, was staying here. She had a really bad accident, an ATV accident. So she's had a broken pelvis and she's been in a wheelchair. So oh. we watched Airplane. We watched Naked Gun. Oh, and great. I thought I was going to have to turn Naked Gun off as O.J. Simpson's going down the stairs in a wheelchair and she's laughing so hard. She's like, this is killing me. It's, it's <laughs> going to be painful. Yeah. It was so That's painful. Good. That was hysterical movies. What I noticed about Airplane, and, um, and of course, there's a lot of humor in your book as well. We're definitely going into that. But I had to ask you, because the first 30 minutes of Airplane, you pummel the audience with laughs. I mean, was that on purpose? I started like timing. It was like contractions. Is there a joke every 20 seconds? It was crazy. Uh, there probably is because that came from, you know, we did five years on stage where we were the performers and we did sketches and we didn't want to be up there while the audience wasn't laughing. So everything mm -hmm. had to be a joke or a setup to the joke. So mm -hmm. it went, you know, set up, joke, laugh. And then we do another setup, joke, laugh. And it was a rhythm. And then to us, it wasn't, hey, this is going to be a great idea. We're going to do this pace in a movie. We just, this is what we did. And it was, on, it was only when the reviews came out and it, all everything that's written about it is, oh, my God, this, there's this incredible pace of, <laughs> of jokes. And we you created we, a whole genre or something. Right. We, we. It was a lot of firsts and nobody had ever thought to do jokes in the ending credits. And <laughs> we never, uh, we never took things seriously and we never stopped making jokes. It wasn't like, okay, the movie's over and now we're going to do credits. No, no, we, <laughs> we had to keep going. And nobody probably ever thought of putting Leslie Nielsen in a comedy. I mean, no, we I all don't. adore him. How did that happen? Well, the concept of the movie was to not cast, you know, Harvey Corman or Dom DeLuise at, who were at the time. Those are the guys in movies, Mel Brooks, you know. And so we, we, Robert Stack was the only one who was our first choice. The others, there were other people in line. Les, when we got to Leslie, which was the fourth one after uh, Stack, Bridges and Graves, um, Leslie, uh, four guys, four other actors had turned down the role. And, uh, and so we went to our casting director at Paramount and we said, how about let's get this guy who was the captain of the Poseidon and he was in Forbidden Planet. We didn't even know his name, but there's that guy. I mean, nobody knew his name. And his name was Leslie Nielsen. And the, the casting director who had all, was already frustrated at having to cast, you know, his name was gonna go as casting Robert Stack, Lloyd Bridges <laughs> and Peter Graves in a comedy. He's coming in so fast, watch your speed. He's coming right at us! Ah! Coming in too hot. He thought it was the end of his career. So he said, he had just exploded. He said, Leslie Nielsen? Leslie Nielsen is the guy you cast the night before. And we were, we were three <laughs> weeks away from 
uh, starting production. So, um, but he, he uh, you know, when the movie came out, he was very proud of it. Oh, I bet. And he just practically stole it. I mean, he was amazing. Can you fly this plane and land it? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Yeah, Love him. he emerged as the guy because he and in the in the first like the table read, he was putting a little spin on it. I, there's nobody had ever done this before doing a comedy with an absolute straight face. And I mentioned that in the book because, you know, my dad would tell hilarious. He would say hilarious things. He didn't tell a joke, didn't know any jokes, but he would say hilarious things with a straight face. And there's one picture of me with my grandfather and my father and my dad and I are wearing bow ties and yes. to match us, my grandfather uh, put, uh, he made his necktie into a ridiculous bow tie that came out to ear and just posed, you know, straight face, you know, just. I saw that picture and I thought, yeah. first of all, where did this guy get this bow tie that's like this? But they were doing, he was doing the Leslie Nielsen. You know. He was doing this, and so <laughs> I had this experience, uh, you know, in our family, of you know people were funny but didn't didn't go ha ha ha. You know, they, they yeah. weren't putting any spin on it. But was I what I was saying in the first table read? Leslie was putting something on it, and we said, "No, we want you to do it like this guy did it." And we gave him a tape of the video of Zero Hour, and there was the doctor character in that, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so. He came back and he had it 100%. He, he did it. And Stack was great, too. They were all they were all great. They all got it. They're good to work with. Yeah, they're good I mean, to work with. Lloyd Bridges. Wow. Yeah, Lloyd, Lloyd at first in the table read and in the in the rehearsals tried was trying to make sense of his dialogue. He wanted <laughs> to say, my character would say this. Said, there is no character. You're just, you know, you're just the scenery. And Stack said, just keep talking, Lloyd. Nobody's listening to us. <laughs> You know, spears are going to the wall and watermelons are falling. Just keep talking. So, and he and Lloyd was great in Airplane. And then he did, he also did the Hot Shots movie where he was fabulous. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these guys enjoyed doing this kind of thing. Was there anybody who just went, oh my gosh, I need to go home and take a vacation? No, they were all, once they signed on, they, they trusted us. Yeah. And even though we were first time directors, um, <clears throat> You know, they're actors and I really do love, I love actors and, you know, I've never had a bad experience with, with any actor. It's just, it's always been, they're, they're great. They, and everybody wanted to be good and Stack, who was like so straight mm -hmm. in like the Untouchables and all his movies, he, his thing, he wanted to do more jokes. He said, please put in more jokes. And so we did. And, oh. and he and he was happy with it. And uh, I think all of them, when they read the script, they, I think they were a little skeptical, but when they met us, I mean, <laughs> reading the script, I mean, when Peter Graves read the script, he threw it in the trash. He said, this is the worst piece of garbage I've ever read. Cause you know, and then thinking about it years later, you know, these actors, they only read their own parts first. They don't really read oh, the whole script. Right. And so, you know, Peter, Graves' part, uh, he he appeared to be playing a pedophile. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think he thought that whoever wrote this was either perverted or a or a, a three drug crazed <laughs> maniacs. And so Howard Koch, our executive producer, uh, convinced Peter to come in and meet us. And so we appeared to be these, you know, just very straight Midwestern guys and uh, Perfectly safe. He, he he felt more comfortable, and so he did it. And Peter's wife and daughter convinced him to do it. Also, awesome. Leave it to the ladies. Was was Kentucky Fried Movie before or after Airplane? It was before Airplane. Before fact, he wrote the script before Kentucky Fried Movie, couldn't sell it. And uh, John Landis came to see our show, and he said, "Why don't you guys do a movie?" of your show, you know, that's, we can get, mm -hmm. probably raise the money for that. So we did that first and it proved to be a good thing, not only because the script wasn't ready yet, was, but we learned how to direct from John Landis. Oh, wow. We learned, we learned on the set because we had never mm -hmm. been on a movie set before. 
Oh my gosh. And this is, this is all going to be part of the ZAZ book, which I'm fantastic. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about, you were saying the family and, and humor in the family. And I remember when we were watching Naked Gun, um, I, I looked at my daughter, I said, who's that actress? And it's, it's the secretary, Ricardo Montalban, and yeah. she comes out and, she, and then she ends up being the robot with the gun yeah. and she's so straight. And there was something about her that just jumped off the screen at me. Oh, really? Then I, so then I'm reading your book. Tell everybody who this woman is. This was my mom. Your mom. <laughs> and, uh, you know, mom was, uh, she was an actress. She, she appeared in, you know, stage productions and repertory theater in, Madis- in uh, Milwaukee. And, uh, you know, she kind of gave that up to raise us. And so mm-hmm. what do we do? We turn it around and <laughs> she's, she ended up, she was in 17 movies. <laughs> that many? I, wow. Yeah, it, was, it was, yeah. And my sister was too, yeah. She was, uh, your mom was also the lipstick lady on airplane, yeah, in, am I right? So she's so, kind so of once we watched that, in, I recognize it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, and then, and she was sport. in basketball as the, you know, recovery nurse and she was in Naked Gun too. And, uh, you know, uh, and also I did a movie called My Boss's Daughter, which is possibly one of my mom's best scenes. And oh. it was... You know, the movie didn't do too well, but but that scene was so good, the one that she was in, and it shows how great of a comic actor Ashton Kutcher is. Yeah, it just he's he's incredible. He's not just a piece of fluff somewhere. He he really he had a lot of talent. And I, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of actors who who had, you know, a lot of comic talent, like Charlie Sheen, you know, Leslie, of course. Uh, Priscilla was great. Um, really? Anna Ferris, you know, in the scary movies. So I, I've I, I've had a lot of luck with that. But my mom was in a lot of movies. <laughs> yeah, she 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 was yeah. fabulous. It's almost like the ones who make it look so easy are the ones who really are brilliant yeah. <clears throat> to be able to make it look that easy and so so real. And again, she wasn't trying to be funny. It's just it yeah. was all it's all acting. It's the funny is in the writing. Yeah. And the writing. So, okay. I had to look and I, I was trying to figure out how long has David Zucker been into family history. Now I did notice in the naked gun, Ricardo Montalban offers Nielsen a cigar and says Cuban. And the first family history joke that I spot comes in. No Dutch Irish. (laughs) You probably, and he said, I think you, you're probably thrown off by the puffy sleeves. (laughs) That's, you know, and, and those jokes, a lot of those jokes were written by the wonderfully talented Pat Proft, who is my writing partner. Fantastic. Were you yeah, involved so, in yeah, the writing of all of them? Pardon me? Were you involved in the writing of all the movies? Or Oh, yeah, with, with all of them. Okay. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if I was credited on all of them, but I was always involved in the, in the writing. I think, yeah, The Naked Guns, yeah, I was, I was yeah, I'm credited as, as one of the writers, yeah. I always, you have to write, yeah. And yeah. then... You never stop writing because you're also kind of writing on set, although there's no there's no ad libbing because it's all, you know, it's all set stuff. But oh, yeah, because the gag's got to work. It reminds me a lot of uh, I love I'm a huge silent film buff. And I think about the gags they constructed. I mean, sometimes they were doing it just on the fly when they turn the camera on, they see what happens. But you could see a construction there and you guys it was just brilliant because it's so seamless. Well, yeah, it's it's all the really heavy lifting is done in the writing. And, you know, Pat and I would we'd spend, you know, eight months just writing the script before we even got on the set. And then, you know, once you're on the set, it's mainly problem solving. Because, mm. you know, you've done the casting and you've done the wardrobe and all this stuff is in pre-production. And so... Once you get it on the set, up on uh, get the scene, we call it, you get the scene up on its feet, then you have to figure out why it's not working. And I just count down, I have a checklist, you know, it's just maybe a speech is too long, you start cutting words and, or the actor has to uh, pick up the pace. Sometimes it's too slow because there's a, there's a definite rhythm in comedy that you have to do. Absolutely. Well, so there's this, a little bit of theme. We see family history kind of slipping into the movies and you got family working with you and friends and people are interrelated. And have you always 
been interested in your family history? I, I have. I, I have an interest in history, just history. Okay. And so that's why I say in the book, I, uh, I was just enthralled with the whole Davy Crockett thing when, you know, when that happened. Mm -hmm. Walt Disney, Davy Crockett. And so I asked my dad, you know, I, I've tried to figure out a way maybe we're related to Davy Crockett, but I would sit and listen to my grandmother who, as I explained in the book, she, uh, she was one of eight brothers and sisters who all came from Hungary in the, you know, first decade of the 1900s. Mm -hmm. And she was the, when they came to America, she was the only one of the eight who talked about it. Nobody else, you know, her younger brother and sister were too young to really remember anything. But um, the, and I was the only one of her uh, 10 grandkids to really pay attention uh, enough to write it down. And finally, I came back from uh, already, I was living in LA, came back in the middle 70s and got the whole story on tape. And yes. And that really struck me, David, because I'm reading this and I'm thinking of all the genealogists I've met as I've traveled the world talking about genealogy. And the biggest regret I hear from people is I could kick myself. I never sat down. I never interviewed yeah. anybody. I, and not only did you sit down and talk with her, I guess she was well into her 80s, but you put the recorder on. What oh, yeah. possessed you to, to do that? I mean, that takes a little effort. I wanted to record it because I somehow I valued this story, all these stories that I had heard since the time I was eight. And I wanted to record it. And so, but it was only like 20 years later that I had a transcript made. And when I had my own kids, uh, I wanted to put it in a book form that they could consume. And they were like three and six at the time. So I, I, I did it in the form of a children's book and not using her words, not using her transcript. Um, it was just, it was a third person narration. Oh. But that, now that's not what this is. I mean, you no, really, it looks like you went back. I, and I did, I had an artist draw the pictures. Again, that, that became, that was from the idea of a children's book. You want pictures. And I also put, you know, the photographs in, but, and the story ended where, with her, they, when they, um, the story ends when they get to America, they get, they arrive in Milwaukee. And so I, it was unsatisfied to me. Mm -hmm. And so, in my movie director, writer, uh, guys, I, I need to have a satisfying ending. So I, I, I gave it to my sister and my cousin Debbie and I, I didn't, uh, they thought it was great, but I, I was not satisfied with it. And so there it went back in the drawer for another 10 years. <laughs> and so now the kids are, you know, and this was a couple of years ago, I picked it up again and I read the transcript. And I thought this is fascinating. That was it. Hear mm -hmm. it from her in her words, and then you get to know uh, my grandmother. And, and so, you fall in love with your grandmother. I have to tell you, I fell in love with Sarah, Sarah Zucker, and I could see why you loved her. And she just loved life, and she loved people. She was yeah. Wonderful. Oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that from a you know from a non Zucker family. Person. Absolutely. I, I wanted to, yeah, I want to just put it there the way she said it mm -hmm. and, and have her tell the story. And then her story goes um, until, I mean, it goes through the first two chapters. I think it's mm -hmm. uh, her, her transcript. And then the third chapter is my dad. And then I take over. I can tell that story from the pictures and there's captions and, and then my sister comes in, my cousin, Debbie, uh, all, all, everybody puts in, you know, some of this fills in some of the story and then finally my story. So, and my story ends of course in 1985 when grandma uh, passes away. So the, and that, that's the end of the book. That's the end. Yeah. So exactly. I think it, it has, it has a, an integrity to it. It does. And she has an impact in your family's life all yeah. the way to the end. One of the interesting things I think that readers are going to find about the book is that it struck me, it has a storyboard feel to it, which I could see kind of maybe your movie producer side coming out in that um, many people are stuck with the idea that 
okay, I've got maybe this story or these memories. I've got some pictures, but I don't have that many photographs. What do I do? And you're not just, you didn't just hire an illustrator, but you got somebody to capture storyboard moments. Am I wrong about that? Because they sure look like movie stills to me. Yeah. Well, you know, the first artist I had on it, Gary Thomas, uh, was my storyboard artist for the Naked Guns and for okay. um, uh, the scary movies. And so I started him on it. And then he did the children's book version. We're still retaining a lot of his drawings. But after that, he didn't want to continue with it. So I found uh, uh, I, I found another artist, Cynthia Angulo, and who was able to uh, mimic his style. And she she's very talented. She could do she could do any style I wanted, but I needed to have a continuity. And so she did. She took over, and she she did the the majority of drawings. Now, back in the children's book era, you know, 2000, 2003, Gary was still on and I flew with Gary to uh, what is now Slovakia. And we found the, the original house and I, there's more photographs of that, that that I put in. So I, I hope maybe I can someday find some period photographs of Hinkovitz, if any exist, uh, it, you know, f- from that turn of the century era. Well, I actually did a little bit of snooping around and I found a couple of old maps from that time frame, which uh, oh. lists the villages. And it's amazing. You talked about going to the Jewish cemetery yeah. and it's just buried in trees. And I mean, it was yeah. amazing that you guys got back there and I pulled it up on Google Earth and you can actually sit right over the top of it and see it. Oh, wow. I and never boy, is that. it buried. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like, it's I don't know how you, how'd you guys get back there. You know, we... We we had a we had a guide translator and this lady, uh, you know we we went to I think it's in uh, Lodomir uh, mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. where my grandmother said it was and then there and one guy said well the gypsies might it may be over there the gypsies might help you and so we came upon this like these gypsies and that's where I took my picture with all of the kids and this one guy volunteered to take us up the hill. And, uh, and, and, and showed us the cemetery. It's, you know, way, you know, if you didn't know, it's not kept up or on the side right. of the road, but we found it. And so, and I, before I went, I consulted with my cousin, Debbie, uh, and whose husband can write and translate Hebrew. So we, uh, she had them write the names down so I could maybe identify a gravestone, but it was, there were so many, and I, I didn't have the time. And so there's, but the, as I say in the book, there's an organization who's re, that, that's restoring these cemeteries, and you know, fencing them around. And mm-hmm. I'm waiting till I can get you know really wealthy, instead of just wealthy. You know, uh, yes, got to get another airplane movie, and then you just another. I'm, there I'm, and... I'm, 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 I've pitched. Uh, I've got a. Uh, I may, may be doing a TV series. So that's that. that might Fantastic. Be. Yeah. I, I'm reading the book thinking this needs to be a movie. I mean, I would love well, to see it, that. It may, there might be something and it may be a movie in it. Who knows? Yeah. Well, I think other family historians um, are when they read this, because you might think, oh, well, I'm going to read somebody else's story. Well, absolutely. Because you are talking about taking the ancestral travels, going out there and actually seeing places in person. I love the homework that you did before you went so that you got the most out of your visit. Because I had heard these stories for so long, like the yeah. flood. Grandma's caught in a flood when she's a year old. Oh, that and, story. <laughs> and I wanted to see where that was and where the bridge was. She said the bridge was washed away. It was such a huge flood. And um, I just had a desire to, because when I, when I read about uh, the Alamo and Davy Crockett, mm-hmm. I wanted to go to San Antonio and see the Alamo. There's and something it, about walking there, isn't there? I want to see the real places. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want, yeah. So I did. And I was thinking too, that you have something really precious for all the rest of us, which is you have a firsthand account from Sarah yeah. about that process of coming through Ellis Island. And I had a great grandmother and grandfather who came through in 1910, um, but I don't have a lot of details. Nobody sat down and talked to them about it. And I'm listening to Sarah talk about what it was like on the ship. What was it like coming through? Where did you get the train? Those were amazing. So you've really captured the 
that really the story for so many Americans. Yeah. And all that would have been lost. And then I have some of the actual, like I have the trunk that she brought over. I was so jealous. (laughs) And so I put it and she didn't talk about the trunk Mm -hmm. to me, but uh, my aunt Eve Joan said, this is the, there's a trunk that, uh, that grandma Sarah said that they brought over from, uh, from Europe. And so I put that in the drawing. I was sure to put that. He's loading the trunk onto the drawing. And also I want my kids to know the importance of these things and the candlesticks and the stories behind them. Because the only thing we have from uh, Hinkovitz are those candlesticks and, and the trunk. So uh, those are amazing. And I love that you use them as just another element to tell the story. And you, what you really did was you just tied all the generations together. I love that, you know, like the, the, was it a watering can that sits on your shelf today? And I, and I investigated that, that was in, uh, my mom used that water, that copper watering can Mm -hmm. for, you know, 20 years while I was there. And it had been left there by my grandmother who had lived in the house before we did. And then I found a, uh, an old letter or my dad sent it to me that it was, uh, it was a, a mother's day gift in 1936 or something. And so I put all these things together and it's, it sits on the shelf with the, with the watering can. And, and so if these objects have meaning for me, and then the other thing I've done is uh, I think it's an original concept, which I call a photo loom, which that any object in a picture has added value. So you haven't, and I didn't even include all the things that I, that I have done with that because I take objects from a picture, like from my, my mom uh, in 1950 standing in front of a table and then I have that table in my, in my den with her pictures on top of it, standing next to this table. And then I have her old, my grandmother's old desk from the mid, mid thirties. Um, and that my mom as a 20, 20 year old sitting in front of that desk and that's on top of the desk. So I want to have, and, and, and I have regrets that there's a picture of our family in fr- and there's shelves and then there's this old radio. And I remember that old radio we had, no one thought to save it. So mm. this is what I, I think people can be inspired by this. To Absolutely. Do this and so, and I, I have it in the, I have, I show the pictures in the book where I mm-hmm. have these, you know, pictures of the family and then, and then they're, they're in front of a table and a, a lamp and that's, and that that picture now hangs above that table. So you see, this is, to me, this is, it's a famous table now. You know, Absolutely. It's, and it's continuing to tell your story to anybody who to comes in your it, home. And it connects me with, with the family. And I want yeah. my kids to be connected with that and to, to value that. So the kids were probably the original audience um, how come you decided not to, I mean, I'm glad you didn't just publish it for just your family. Cause I think everybody's going to love it, but how, why did you just publish it publicly instead of just publishing it in your own family? Uh, my thinking is that if something is interesting to me, it will be interesting to other people. And I read the book and I, I, I love it. I want to share it with people. And I think that uh, people, people who I know who have read it, I mean, everybody says, gee, I wish I had talked to my grandmother. I yes. wish I, I, everybody. So uh, let's, you know, get this out and have people do it. I mean, I think it's going to really be inspiring. So give some folks advice, those who are listening and they're thinking, doggone it, I do need to sit down and make this happen. Um, one, I just, I love the format. I think if nothing else, people are going to see this and they're going to say, this is kind of a neat format. I might be able to do something like this instead of some big written out novel. What advice would you give people? I would say, uh, it's, this is easy to do. It was pretty easy for me to do. So if you get the, get the record, your grandmother or your grandfather, whoever is, is still alive, get the stories and then you can put it, just arrange it in that transcript form. And then you can, you can put the pictures in. I mean, if you're kind of computer savvy, 
what I did, I'll tell you, we got we found this lady in the Philippines who does the layout, oh. and it would it cost under five hundred dollars. Wow. So yeah, it's like, and they do this stuff, and then another guy in uh, in in Spain did the cover. <laughs> after it was my idea for the cover. I, I love the cover. He yeah. did the polish, but I think that and then but you can you can. Uh, uh, arrange all the pictures. And then, I mean, it may be expensive to have an artist. I mean, I, I, I spent some money on the artist and, you know, I would meet with Cynthia. I mean, this is over 20 years. I, you know, I meet with Gary and then I met with Cynthia every, every uh, once a month at a Starbucks in <laughs> El Segundo, which is in between where she lives in. She's, I think, in Newport Beach and I'm in uh, Brentwood. So, we would meet over coffee on a Sunday morning. Yeah. That's so cool. Well, congratulations yeah. on getting it done. You know, I, uh, that's what I'm most proud of is that I just, I got it. I you got it done. And it was, I mean, it's, as I said, it's been years. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you included your dad's generation and your generation, and you didn't try to write your entire story. I think that was the other big takeaway was that, look, pick the, the highlights, yeah. show the continuity, but you don't have to, to, to spend the rest of your life writing everything that ever happened, which nobody right. would want to read anyway. Yeah. And I said, as I said, that's another book and we're going yeah. to do another book, which is going to be, uh, you know, it's already 181 pages. The, oh, uh, you are busy. Yeah. You know, the, the, the ZAZ book or more, I don't know how many, well, maybe, maybe 181 pages is the, uh, before the invention of smiling. I can't remember. It but. was 160, 180, something like that. Okay, then that then the ZAZ book is 300 pages. It's oh, like, wow. It's really, uh, but I think it's it's for a you know, larger audience. It's a different book. But what I wanted, what I figured out what to do is to do this book within my grandmother's l- lifetime and to do it as it related to grandma. So I tell the Kentucky Fried Theater story and how, we were, you know, reluctant to show it to her because it's pretty raunchy. And then, <laughs> you know, and and my rock and roll band, and she came to see one of our gigs. So, and my sister's wedding, where there's a picture of me with grandma. And wherever there was a picture of me with grandma, I put it in and tried to include it. So, uh, so that that's how I did it. But I didn't want to go too far off the track of it's it's about grandma's story. Yeah. Did you do any genealogy research yourself? Well, uh, from what, what the family, for everything I could learn from the family, I mm-hmm. got family trees and, uh, and from grandma's research and from a few family trees that have been done before. So we discovered the names of, I think my grandmother's grandmother was Hanuska and we got, I think her parents, we, we found out who her parents were. And then back beyond that, there's, you, you don't have anything. There's, and and one thing I discovered later was that all the marriages were arranged. And mm-hmm. I mean, this is not something that I had a concept of going into doing the book. I discovered it as I did the book. And what was particularly striking about my grandma's story is that she was the, she was the bridge from the old world to the modern world. And before my grandmother, uh, life went at the speed of a horse's horse, you know, and horse and wagon for thousands, thousands of years. It was the same thing. And then suddenly, um, you know, she gets into a world and in her village, there was no running water, no electricity. I mean, it was primitive. They had to go to Krakow to find the nearest train. And I'm sure there were telephones in Krakow and even mm-hmm. more modern things, but there were no airplanes. And I say, you know, when she got to uh, Ellis Island and saw the Statue of Liberty, a month later, there was a Wright Brothers plane flying around and attracted a million New Yorkers to see this. So I give some, I had no idea of, you know, what context that when she came to America, where things were. So she was, and her lifetime spanned the Wright brothers flying around the Statue of Liberty uh, to the moon landing, you know, and beyond that. So uh, well, I don't she know, was... there, were, there were probably computers in, 
in 1985. But yeah. uh, she, her lifestyle style really, and but what I was saying mainly was that she was the first modern, I mean, her parents lived the same way, never learned English and lived the same way as they had lived for thousands of years. And Sarah uh, didn't want an arranged marriage. She didn't want to be Orthodox Jewish. She wanted to be, they became reform, which was started in Germany in 1948. And, you know, became, it was just, everything was modern. And she didn't want, and they, the women had to shave their heads once I they know, they got married. That. Like it's crazy. It's, it's, there's some craziness about it, but I grew up because, you know, in reform Judaism, which is much more like being a Presbyterian, you know, you, you sit in, it's all like city of pews and, and there's a choir and they didn't have this in Orthodox, you know, they, they didn't have, this was all a change. And um, so, and I didn't have perspective on that. Didn't know that until I did this book. And real, and so it's it's kind of I do talk about this in the introduction of the book that everything changed once yeah. my grandmother came to America. It did. She she was exceptional. It sounded like her mother was really exceptional, and she was very esteemed in her village. And her, gra think, and her grandmother. Her grandmother. I, did, I didn't know. I never met, of course, her her mother, but uh, you know, her mother was more, you know, not a big personality, mm -hmm. but her grandmother. But, the grandmother was more like it skipped a generation and then sarah was among her eight brothers and sisters sarah was the straw that stirred the drink mm -hmm. and you know she you know and and so and so i i can see where i get whatever and jerry and i got our adventure because grandma wanted to come to america and her mother wouldn't leave and uh she had to convince she had to convince her mother. And that's a lot of the drama in the book is, is, you know, trying to convince her mother. Her mother was very conservative and was afraid that they wouldn't keep kosher when they came to America. Mm -hmm. and, and grandma promised her that she would keep kosher and shave her head. It's crazy. Uh, you know, of course, at the, at the, at the wedding and I had, I still have the wedding invitations and I have pictures of there's photographs of her wedding. And, but I do the, uh, and then in a drawing, I have uh, her mother saying to Sarah, you, basically you're off the hook. You don't have, to, I get it, it's America. Well, she was exceptional. She came to a pretty exceptional country that just took off from 1900 to today. Yeah. And, um, and here you are out there making a mark for yourself in a long- right. it's, a, it's an incredible from, when you think of my grandmother, mother you know the life that yeah. they led and her grandmother and then jerry and i are hollywood <laughs> movie directors it's like <laughs> it is kind of a crazy story but you know uh but through it all of course i still feel this attachment to the family and i i want my kids to have that too well, and you've given it to all the rest of us as well. And I, I can't recommend it enough. I really did love the book. Um, it's before the invention of smiling. And um, we're going to have information below this video where everybody can get to it and in the podcast show notes. And David, I can't wait to hear more about whatever the TV series is. Um, you've got to keep producing. You've got, I can tell you've got a lot more to come, don't you? I've got, a, yeah, my, uh, my hero is Clint Eastwood, who's still directing at 92. So, and I'm just a young guy, so yeah. As you got years to go and things to produce. We'll yeah, look I'm forward to it. 42, so yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> hey, David, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure um, talking oh, yeah, with you today. No. You have been great. And I love, it's a subject that I like, so it's great. And uh, yeah, uh, have a great week and year too. Thank uh, I'm you. I'm sure I'll be back with you for something else, so. Please do. I'm sure you've got other family stories to tell. Yeah, of course, I'm inviting myself back on your podcast. Uh, okay, it's recorded, so it has to happen right. now. Great. All right. <laughs> Thank you, David. Sure, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Such a treat having David Zucker here on the show. I want to thank him so much for joining us. <clears throat> and he's a lot like us, isn't he? He's just uh, passionate about his family. He's made the trips. Uh, I hope you were inspired to do more, to look for more, to um, travel more places, to see your ancestors' locations, to tell their stories in your home. Um, I just, and I think you're going to love the book. So be sure and check out the 11s is with Lisa show notes. This is episode 45. And I wanted to mention really quick, and I'm just so glad I love seeing you guys in chat. I'm so glad you enjoyed the show. Um, One of the things, one of the reasons I'm thrilled to see you is because of course, Roots Tech is going on this week. Now, in reality, Roots Tech, these these are videos, and they're going to be available all year long. So I'm just so thrilled that you uh, came over and joined us here live because I miss all the interaction that we normally would have at the conference. So this was kind of our little taste of that, I think, today. And of course, if you're watching on the video replay, we're just so glad that you're joining us here as well. One of the things um, that happens is that there's always big announcements. And I heard about this big announcement a couple of months ago, and it's been really hard to keep my mouth shut. I am not known for keeping my mouth shut. But my heritage just announced today they have this new feature. Now you know that they can enhance your photos and colorize your photos. This is a photo of me from the fourth grade. And they have this new feature. And it was it was fun to see what they called it. So it came out deep nostalgia. So what does this do? Okay, I threw this together really quick this morning, I wanted to show you what it looks like when you upload your photo to my heritage with the uh, your subscription. And it, I mean, it's really strange to see myself moving there, but I got to tell you, that actually looks like me. I don't have home movies from that time frame, so that's pretty cool. And in fact, I took the liberty of uh, taking the bow tie picture with Grandpa, with David Sucker, and I am very excited to share this with him because, wow, it really brings these photos to life. And it enhances them. So I encourage you to um, maybe go check that out. It's called Deep Nostalgia. And if you have um, the MyHeritage subscription, of course, you're going to be able to take advantage of that and do tons and tons of them. Good news is it's not going to alter your photos, but it's going to allow you to download the little video. And I again, one more piece in the puzzle of intriguing the next generation to be interested. And the more we can bring our ancestors to life, uh, the more we can do that. And oh, am I behind my picture here? 14 years. Okay, so we're celebrating 14 years today for Genealogy Gems and the Genealogy Gems podcast. Back in 2007, I published the very first episode. And back then, podcasting was just barely out of the cradle. I mean, uh, it had just been invented about a year, year and a half before that. I spent most of my time the first couple of years at conferences just explaining to people what in the heck a podcast was. And it was really hard because we didn't have cell phones when this came out. Can you believe that? We didn't have cell phones. We had iPods. And so you had to figure out how to subscribe through iTunes on your iPod your MP3 player. I know we have people in the audience who have probably um, had to do that. You've been listening that long and I so appreciate it. Nowadays, it's super easy and we actually have our own app. So go to your app store and put in Genealogy Gems or my name, the app will pop up. Uh, It's a great way to listen. Of course, you can listen through all the most popular podcasting apps. And if you have an Alexa, you can say, hey Alexa, play the Genealogy Gems podcast. And the music comes on and you hear it. So uh, I just want to thank you as we wrap up this show, because I want to tell you uh, that the podcast, Elevens is with Lisa, all this, total joy for me, but it's all because of you. And uh, you're the ones who responded and have listened and have watched and have told your friends about the shows, which I really appreciate. And um, I just want to thank you so much for listening and for watching, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.